Good morning, I'm Chris Fox, and today we are talking about constructing a fictional language. This is something that a lot of viewers of this channel have done. Many of you are into fantasy and science fiction. Many of you are not. Many of you write romance or mystery or some genre where you don't necessarily need to make a fictional language. But I think that what you see here in this video today will still be useful to your writing. Because how you present characters, what they say, and what their speech patterns are matter a great deal and can really help you convey a dialect. So in other words, if you've got a Russian character in your story and you want them to sound Russian, this video is going to show you how I do that. So in the next section of the video, we're going to talk about some general rules of language and things you need to think about when you're constructing one. And then we're going to get into how I've constructed a language and how I actually write it. So we'll look at a couple of passages from TechMage to show you one of my characters that's using a fictional language. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the requirements portion of the video. Okay, so we typically start when constructing a language with word order. What order are the words spoken in? So in every sentence, you typically have a subject, a verb, and an object. So I went to the store, I, subject, went, verb, store, object. And these can be in any order. Depending on the language that's being spoken, they can be quite counterintuitive. So instead, you might hear, went to the store I did. <laughs> sounds familiar, right? You've heard this before. It, it sounds a lot like Yoda. So what George Lucas did is he changed the word order, and that's it. That was the one change that he made. And now we've got one of the most iconic characters in modern entertainment, modern cinema. We all know Yoda. We all know how he talks. And George Lucas got all that mileage out of just one change. He just simply changed the word order. So we got the impression that Yoda probably spoke a different language and spoke it differently than we would speak English. And this is sort of how you know, his broken English was. So start with word order and figure out, do I want my language to sound alien? If you do, mess with the word order. Because that's going to be the most jarring change you can make to somebody. And if you want a jarring language, and sometimes you do, that's a way you can achieve it. If you decide, on the other hand, that that's too jarring and you don't want to change the word order, you want it to be somewhat similar to English so it's not knocking the reader out of the story, then keep that word order preserved. You know, mess with that kind of at your peril. There are quite a few other letters that you can pull that are going to get you similar mileage without making that kind of big sweeping change. So one of those is a simple suffix. Some languages, like Japanese, will make it very clear when they're doing something like asking a question. So, doko ni imasu ka? You've got that ka at the end, and that ka will always denote a question. If you hear ka at the end of a sentence in Japanese, it means they're asking you a question. This is, is pretty universal. And the word that they're tacking that ka onto can be used as a statement if you take the ka away. So how they conjugate that word is based on whether or not it's a question. That simple ka suffix accomplishes a lot. Suffixes are something the Egyptians used. If you look at female names, female names usually ended in T. So segment, bastet, that was something they did a lot. It was, it was common and it was replicated enough that you can tell whether a god is female or male generally based on whether or not the last letter is T. Some people will argue that set ends in T and, you know, isn't he a guy? Well, yes, set is a dude, but his name actually is mistranslated. Originally it was Seth. There was an H at the end of that, so he did not end in T. So you can, you can have these little suffixes that will really add a lot of flavor to a language. And if you're using them consistently, readers are going to start picking up on it. They're going to start seeing that all of your you know, male characters end in a Y or whatever it is that you do in your language, as long as you're doing that consistently. And there are other good ways, other hallmarks that you can make your language stand out to match a real-world language. So Russian is one of my favorite examples. Russian is one of the most economical languages. It uses a standard SVO, so it sounds a lot like English, but where we would say, I went to the store, they would say, went to store. They're cutting out that pronoun, they're cutting out the the, they're getting rid of every word they feel isn't necessary. And in general, they can get away with it because the speaker is implied. I went to the store. If I'm speaking and I'm not saying somebody else's name, of course it's me. Who else is it going to be? So they sort of get away with that. But when you hear somebody speak like that economically, like they you know, went to store, it sounds very weird to us. We feel like there's words missing. So you can adopt a pattern like that, like the way Russians do it, into your fictional language very easily and just give it a very similar pattern. So really, you can sort of see what we're doing here. We're looking at real-world languages, picking up what their patterns are, and we're just picking and choosing. So maybe you want a suffix like Japanese has, 
but you also want to cut pronouns like Russian does so that your language has both of these features. It can get really tempting, especially once you've studied four or five languages, to start piling these features on. I would limit it to two or three, but if through the course of a novel you are replicating the same two or three features over and over and over, by the end of that novel, people will know how your language is spoken. Even if they can't tell you they know how it's spoken, they know how it's spoken, they know what it sounds like, and their ear is going to pick up on it. So the trick for you is to find those things and then leverage them heavily. If you want a harsh, guttural-sounding language, study Germanic, you know, any of the Germanic languages. If you want something more lyrical, maybe French or Japanese. So really look at kind of the source language and, and match the feel of what you're trying to create for your own language and then just study those patterns. If you're unsure how to do this, I did find a wonderful course. It's on Audible, so it's just a single credit. It's like 45 hours long. It took forever to listen to, but I loved it. It was the Great Courses language course. And basically it went over the structure of language and, and talked about it globally. So if you want more material, definitely worth your time. Anyway, we've now gone over kind of the rules of how this is supposed to work. Let's go ahead and jump into what I did with one of these languages and I'll show you a couple of passages from TechMage. Okay, so let's look at how I've used this in the Magitech Chronicles. So what I created is something that I call drifters. And drifters are basically space halflings. They are like halflings from Lord of the Rings, but try to imagine if a halfling from Lord of the Rings talked like Brad Pitt from the movie Snatch. So think about this thick accent. It's difficult to understand what Brad Pitt is saying. All the words are usually mushed together, but there are some commonalities there. And so what I did is I listened to parts of Snatch over and over, and I also found a few other videos on the internet of people that were speaking with these same similar speech patterns, and I mined them. I started looking for words that they use commonly, substitutions, how they changed certain speech patterns. So instead of the word just, for example, it always came out juiced. And in looking at these things, I very quickly identified what I wanted to use. So I didn't take necessarily every one of these substitutions, but I took a few. And, and this sentence is a little over the top. Her dialogue in the book isn't quite um, as exaggerated as this. But you can see I was sort of playing with it to see how she might sound like. Like I replaced they with te and just with juiced, and she's got proper instead of proper. And these things are said on a regular basis. So these are the patterns that are going to be reinforced through the book. But I wanted to be careful. So I've got two characters, and Kezia is one of them. Kezia is kind of a main character. She's, you know, she's in many of the scenes in the book. And because she is used frequently, I made her speech a little bit more understandable than one of the other characters. So I have another character in the book named Beetle. Let's see if I can find that chapter now. Yeah, here we go. So when Beetle talks, his speech is much, much more difficult to understand. He mashes a lot more of his words together. He's a much more extreme example of what the equivalent of Irish travelers, of my drifters, would sound like in my setting. And if you went through an entire book where you had a character that was talking like this, I think you'd shake readers loose. They'd, they'd have a really hard time picking out and translating constantly. So that's why Kezia only has a few word substitutions and has, like I guess, less of an accent. But this character, who is in one scene, gives readers the impression that there is a side of the culture that is much heavier and uses a lot more of these word substitutions. So hopefully you can see between Kezia and Beetle here how I've sort of manifested this language. I just picked out patterns that I liked, I listened to the source material, and then I implemented that into what I was writing. Uh, I've definitely erred on the side of less is more. I'm not going to use a ton of additional speech patterns for Kezia, just a few, enough that it's clear that she has an accent and that you know maybe she's from a different culture. And I'm gambling that that's gonna be enough to convince you that, that there's this whole 90% of her culture and language that you're not seeing. So we're going back to that iceberg thing that Brandon Sanderson mentioned of the 10% of the world building above the water, 90% under, and that's what I'm attempting to do here. So hopefully this video was useful. If it was, you know, shoot me a comment. Let me know. If you have questions about language or any other world building topic, go ahead and put those in the comments. I appreciate you guys sticking with me. I am going to go ahead and get back to the writing. One last bit of news before I go. Tech Mage, the first draft, was finished last week. And the edited version is going out to the editor tomorrow. So within a couple of weeks, I will have beta versions available that you can take a look at if you want to see how I am utilizing language. Anyway, guys, I will see you next week. Take care.